Hey guys, what's going on? My name is Dr. Colin Zhu, and thank you so much for being here with us. This is the Thrive Bites podcast, and welcome to season five. Here we talk about three things, plant-powered living, enhancing emotional resilience, and creating a thriving mindset. And I interview the most passionate guests here, ranging from physicians to coaches to dietitians to entrepreneurs. And my hope is to give you really informative and high-valued conversations. So please Follow us here on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, and wherever you hear your podcasts. Come on in, and I can't wait to see you inside. Hey, everyone. Uh, It's Dr. Colin Zhu again. Um, Thank you so much for coming back to Thrivebytes. For this episode, I am joined by my good friend and colleague, uh, Chef Lauren Kretzer. Uh, She is a wonderful, wonderful person. Um, Not only is she a professional vegan chef, recipe developer, and holistic coach, she's also a mom, wife, and a cancer survivor. And we unpack her journey uh, through her professional career and her healing journey over time. And it's a wonderful episode. Very, very touching, wonderful person. Um, So you don't want to miss out on this episode. So please join us. Okay, guys. Well, welcome to another episode of Thrive Bites Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Colin Zhu. And thank you so much for being here with us. You could have been anywhere in the world and you decided to spend just a few moments with us today. And I am eternally grateful. So for today, I have a lovely, lovely, lovely guest. Uh, I can't wait to dive deep um, into this episode with you, but she is Chef Lauren Kretzer, and she is a professionally trained vegan chef, recipe developer, and a holistic nutritionist. She attended the Natural Gourmet Institute in New York City and holds a certificate in plant-based nutrition from uh, Cornell uh, University and completed uh, coursework in nutrition and cancer at the University of uh, uh, Arizona's Andrew Weil Center for Integrative uh, Medicine. Very great program. Um, And she strongly believes in a powerful health benefits of a plant-based diet and has used food and a holistic lifestyle uh, changes to heal um, her following, um, following her own cancer diagnosis. And she currently creates recipes for New York Times bestselling authors, um, Dr. Will B, um, famously, you know, the author of uh, Fiber Field, Chris Carr, and her work has appeared in Vogue, Veg News, Food 52, New York Magazine, Well and Good, Mind Body Green, Yoga Journal, and others. We can take the whole episode just to list her accolades. And her current um, endeavor um, is her newsletter called Plant Magic, where she focuses on cooking, nutrition, healing, and wellness. So, Without further ado, please welcome Chef Lauren. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Colin. How are you? <laughs> oh, man. It's so good to see you. Um, you too. We were talking a, a little bit offline, and um, you know, it's been a long time coming. Uh, we were saying, like, what, 10 years? Um, yeah. Wow, it's been a decade. <laughs> <laughs> we're a little overdue, but we're here, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're here. We're here. <laughs> Um, so, um, please let the audience know, uh, where you're calling from today. So I am calling in from my home in Northern New Jersey, um, live in Mendham and farm country. Love it here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm, uh, born and raised um, in New Jersey myself. So when I get over there, I'm going to come knocking on your door and be like, <laughs> Lauren, make me some food. <laughs> <laughs> and you definitely should. So. <laughs> uh, I would definitely take you off on uh, t- uh, up on the offer, and um, <laughs> so I am super stoked. Um, not only uh, you are so many different things, uh, more importantly, we're also very good friend friends, uh, former classmates, and I want to dive deep and share your wonderful, wonderful, you know, story. Um, and uh, it's such a beautiful story, um, and I want to be able to share that with our audiences uh, today. And I just want to thank you for taking the time out. I know you're a very busy, you know, mom, wife, um, and all the different things that you do. So number one, thank you for oh. taking the time out to do this with us today. Thank you. I'm just honored to be on your show. So thanks for giving me your, <laughs> your time. <laughs> oh, no, it's good. It's good. We're, we're in good company. So mm-hmm. um, if only there's a way I can like, you know, instant like FedEx, like, you know, a cup <laughs> of your favorite beverage right now and be like, oh. okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the, the first question uh, we like to start off with the podcast is the origin story, right? How do people go from A to B? So you are so many different things. Um, I guess the first natural question I have uh, for you is 
how did you come to find, um, you know, immersing yourself, um, you know, in the vegan slash plant-based lifestyle and cooking and ultimately, you know, going uh, further and deeper into that pathway? How did it originate? Sure. So my story is pretty much a lifelong story. So I'll try to condense it just so we're not talking about my life the whole time. Um, but my dad became a vegetarian when I was a kid. So when I was in elementary school, he became vegetarian. He read John Robbins um, classic book, Diet for a New America. It changed his life and he changed his diet and never at any point urged the family to go along with it. But I think just being mm -hmm. a child and being curious, I wanted to know why. And he explained he was doing it for his health, but also for the benefit of the animals. So as a kid, I gave up meat um, pretty much almost 100% for ethical reasons. Um, and I gave it up in stages. I think first I gave up like beef and I never liked fish. So that and then a couple of years later, chicken and poultry. And was a vegetarian for the rest of my childhood into adulthood and through college and actually into culinary school. I was a vegetarian and, um, you know, just always loved you know, being meat free, and then never even thought about being vegan. In fact, I think I've said many times, I could never be vegan. I love cheese too much. I probably said that in culinary school many times. <laughs> but the school that we went to, as you know, is health supportive. And even though it's not a vegan school, it kind of espouses like all kinds of um, dietary yeah. viewpoints and veganism is one of them. We had a couple vegan classmates. So that was really my first formal introduction into veganism. So just being interested in health, like especially even more so from going to Natural Gourmet, I started listening to different podcasts and reading different books. And um, there's one podcast in particular, Colleen Patrick Goudreau's podcast really impacted me. Um, she just spoke so, um, I don't know what the word, I guess joyfully, because she calls herself the joyful vegan and she really is, um, just so mm. joyfully about the vegan lifestyle. And it never seemed like one of deprivation. She just talked about all the delicious things she eat and cook. And I would get hungry listening to her. And then just talking about the ethical uh, implications yeah. of eating dairy, which I didn't know about. Um, it really kind of opened my eyes to that. So I went vegan. I don't know when it was. I think it was 2013. Um, mm -hmm. and it was baby steps. You know, I had like cheese night once a week where I would have mm -hmm. cheese on my pizza. <laughs> and just, you know, at, at a certain point, just kind of lost my taste for it. Um, mm. So I've been vegan since then. And that's hard to do. A lot of people are really like heart addicts for cheese. Like it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Well, I had to wean myself off because it is physically addictive, as I'm sure you know. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Dr. Neil Barnard has a whole book out about cheese addiction, the cheese <laughs> trap. And yep. so it's a real, it's a real thing. And, you know, when people say they can't give up cheese, you know, I definitely empathize, sympathize with them. It's tough, yep. but it can be done. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've been vegan since 2013. And then in the last few years, I've kind of shifted my diet more toward like whole food, plant-based, which is still vegan, but just no, well, I shouldn't say no, hardly any processed foods, um, just relying more heavily on foods in their natural form and eliminating mm -hmm. like refined sugars, things like that. Yeah. So that's why I'm here today. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm glad. Uh, so many, so many things. Um, as you can probably hear, you know, uh, as she's alluding, uh, has alluding to, you know, we were former classmates at the North Natural Gourmet Institute uh, that has uh, been, oh man, how many years acquired by uh, the Institute for Culinary Education? Um, I think it's I don't want to say, I, I'm sorry. What, when, when the school started? The the school started in the 70s. Yeah, in the 70s. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, by Anne-Marie Colbin. Uh, we were there 2011 to 2012. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I think what my fondest memories um, from that was, I love the fact that we were such an intimate group um, yeah. because it was such a small school because it's yep. Manhattan, right? Yep. It was in Chelsea. Uh, 21st street. Yeah. I think 21st street. And, uh, it was just so small and I think it had three kitchens, one, two, three. Yeah. Three yeah. kitchens. Um, and we were just so lucky. I don't know how we got that lucky to only had, I think we had six, um, six or seven. Eight, at six, the time. Yeah. It was no more than eight. Uh, yeah. But it's probably somewhere in that arena, definitely less than 10, which was half the size of a normal class there. Half the size. Yeah. Half the size. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and then if you can imagine all these, you know, uh, you know, chef students, you know, just clamoring over a stove, but I guess it prepares you to be, you know, in yeah. the restaurant <laughs> industry, right. Yeah. To be able to bob and weave with your body and, you know, really hot stuff. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. What was your fondest memory, um, from our experience? Oh God. I like, I think back on our time in culinary school and it's like, I can't even not smile. It's just the happiest <laughs> time of my life. I I just wish I could have paused it and gone back. I mean, like, just the, like you said, the intimacy, feeling like, you know, when you walked into Natural Gourmet and it's old, you know, iteration, the original school, Mm -hmm. not, I haven't been in the current one. um, It just felt like, you know, you were cooking in someone's home. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, like everything was just so, you know, done with love and done with real passion. And I just remember Mm -hmm. going in and getting tea and looking at the bookshelf when we would go in and just (sighs) chatting like every morning and just like, I couldn't wait to learn. And I've always been, you know, a student, I I love to learn, but this was like, it didn't even feel like school. It just felt like I got to play all day. And it was just so exciting. And then going out and externing like at the different restaurants afterward, after we graduated, Mm -hmm. it was just a really cool time of my life. Yeah, yeah, it was, um, it was really my one of my first, um, probably best examples of marrying food and relationships. Mm -hmm. you know, um, together, you know, it's just what you just said, you know, the, all the people that work there, they did it, you know, honestly, like if they weren't paid anything, they honestly did it out of pure love because they just loved everything that they did, you know, Mm -hmm. um, you know, from the front end to the back end. And, um, and I had a chance to kind of go back over a few years to attend different events. And it's just, you know, um, yeah, it's sad that it kind of dissolved, but, you know, uh, has been evolving with the right. Institute for Culinary Education. Um, so, yeah, um, it's been, you know, such a great, great, you know, thing. Um, so going off of what you're saying, the the cheese, um, you know, uh, you know, involving yourself at a very early you know time. Do you feel just kind of like a, a, a an off question? Do you feel like where we're at now? Do you think we've done enough in terms of making like alternatives and, um, you know, j- just these different edifications of, you know, dairy alternatives, cheese alternatives? Like, do you feel like it's gone in a different direction? Um, it's good efforts or we need more? Would you say? Um you know, I think there's good and bad. I think the positive to it is it's just so accessible now to be plant-based. Um, there's really hardly any excuse now, unless I, I'm lucky I live on, I live in the Northeast. So I live close to a lot of great supermarkets that stock all this stuff. And I know not everyone is so fortunate, but even if you were to live, you know, in an area that doesn't have a Whole Foods or a Trader Joe's nearby, beans and lentils and vegetables are available everywhere and now pretty much tofu too. So I think like, you know, the, all the vegan yogurts and dairy, and like you were saying, it's just, it's great to see it. Um, some of it is healthier than others. You know, it's still at the end of the day, processed food, Mm -hmm. but I wouldn't, especially from an environmental and ethical standpoint, I mean, it's just making such a positive impact that I, I, I think it's wonderful. Um, Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people who otherwise might not try to reduce their dairy intake if there wasn't a substitute for it. So I think if it's going to encourage people to move in that direction, I'm all for it. Um, But I don't think it should be, you know, your final destination. I think the final destination, especially from a, a, a health standpoint, but also to an extent from an environmental standpoint, from all the packaging from this stuff is to try to get back in the kitchen and cook because Mm -hmm. that's really going to be what benefits you the most, um, your health, your well-being. Um, I think cooking is just important in general, bringing families together. Um, and then also, like I said, from an environmental standpoint, you're just using so much less packaging. So if, you know, we can all kind of shift in that direction, I think it's wonderful, but I don't think anyone Mm -hmm. should feel guilty about eating like a plant-based sausage or yogurt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, they've actually done studies um, comparing like, for example, you know, Beyond Meat, uh, Impossible Meat versus like a regular, you know, burger. And Mm -hmm. um, yeah, at the end of the day, it's still plant derived ingredients. Mm -hmm. It is at the end of the day process, just a bunch of stuff put together. Um, And uh, yeah, and I think what's great about these companies is that, you know, they, you know, they're, they're, startups, you know, big companies that have the resources to be able to evolve the ingredients. And I, you know, for my patients, I label them as like transition foods, Mm -hmm. mostly geared towards, you know, meat lovers that have something, right? Because we didn't, we didn't have that when we were in school, you know, we were, 
you know, not not too long ago, we were still in the age of, you know, tofurkey, right? You right. know what I'm saying? Where yeah. it's like, you know, the least advertising, you know, thing. And there's so many things that exploded over time. And I think it's great for the transitioners, you know, but I agree with you. It's uh, about eating as close to mother nature, you know, as possible, not just for our palate, um, but, you know, ultimately for our health. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, so you graduated school. Um, how have you, you know, what's interesting about Natural Gourmet is that we attracted so many different kinds of people from all walks of life. It's health mm-hmm. supportive, it's plant-based, right? Um, it was a lot of traditional, you know, Asian cuisines, as mm-hmm. opposed to really, really being a, a deeper dive into like the French, um, you know, uh, side of it, like most traditional schools. Right. How did you take those elements, um, you know, afterwards, like, you know, how did you apply it? You know, what was the next step after school for you? Um, well, I think from like a theoretical standpoint, I think, you know, like you were saying, it kind of, we kind of got the best of both worlds. Cause we got these, um, more fringe, I guess, like, uh, training with Eastern, um, traditional Chinese medicine and also Ayurveda. We were taught those things in school. Um, the school itself is based heavily in macrobiotic theory, So a lot of that stuff was totally unfamiliar to me. So I got like, you know, a real great foundation in different kinds of natural medicine and that stayed with me, you know, which I will go into later. But I think we also got some great traditional French training, even though we didn't do traditional French foods, like, you know, Mm -hmm. duck à l'orange, like we learned traditional like French knife cuts and, um, you know, cooking methods. So I kind of felt when I was done, like I had wonderful training. So if I wanted to work at a five-star restaurant, I could, but I also had this, you know, education now in natural medicine that I could take and apply professionally or personally, which, you know, I have like now when I cook, I think a lot about balance. I think a lot about seasonality and that, um, you know, was instilled in us pretty much every day in culinary Mm -hmm. school. And I've also learned that food can be a healing mechanism, which, you know, I'm not sure I would have leaned so heavily on, you know, in my personal and professional life had I not received that training, um, mm. you know, that was built into the curriculum. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and it's, you know, really, you know, it's it's reflective of the late Amory Colvin. Um, mm-hmm. You know, she held a PhD. She really, she wrote the books on uh, food and healing. Um, I actually have like all of her books. Um, and yeah. uh, she, she's, she was a great, you know, individual. And, um, you know, and I think, you know, from my standpoint, and then attracted a lot of other people in the health and wellness, we had coaches there, we had, you know, therapists there. Um, mm-hmm. I even met a psychiatrist there once, um, mm-hmm. because I was one of the very few uh, physicians that came through the school at the time. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, because my background was, uh, you know, my mother raised me, she's a Chinese medical doctor, and she grounded me in prevention. And so, mm-hmm. you know, it just made a lot of sense, you know, when I mm-hmm. chose the school. Mm-hmm. Um, so for you, what, um, what, you know, came after that, you know, a lot of people would take that education to go, you know, directly into the restaurant business, open up their catering company, um, private chef, you know, mm-hmm. what was the next few steps after that for you? Um, well, when I when we graduated, I was really driven to be a chef in the traditional sense. You know, I wanted to I felt like I had something to prove, honestly, because I was vegetarian and I had been told by so many like because when I was uh, researching culinary schools, I was working on Wall Street and I was really afraid to give up my job because it was career mm-hmm. stability. It was money. Um, you know, there was a clear path ahead of me. And, you know, giving that up was a little a little risky. So I was, I spent like two years, like basically like just grilling people in the industry about like how much money they made, what they do, what they like best about their job, what they like least, you know, all this stuff, trying to like figure out how this was going to work for me. And every single time I mentioned that I was vegetarian, it was like (laughs) the mic just dropped. It was like, well, you're not going to be able to really work and no one's going to hire you and no one's going to want to, you know, have you in the restaurant. Da, 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 da. And this just goes to show what you were saying before, how much things have changed since then. You know, you, now you have 11 Madison Park, which is vegan. I feel like saying, ha, I told you. But you know, <laughs> back then, no one wanted to hear it. So when I came out of school, I was like, I'm going to cook. I'm going to be good at what I do. And I really wanted to prove something. So I got an externship at Anissa, which um, has since closed, but is a Michelin starred restaurant in New York City, home by Anita Lowe, who's, you know, award winning cookbook author and chef. 
And, um, you know, the fire was really lit under me. Love that job. It was just like really punishing work though. So when I came out of that externship, I was like, I don't know if restaurant works for me. The hours were nuts. Like every day I just physically like couldn't stand up at the end of my shift. And so I just figured, let me do private chefing because it paid better. The hours were better. And I started seeing like I could get some really cool high profile clients. So I actually was working for some celebrities at the time. I was cooking for, you know, lots of regular families in the tri-state area. And for a long while, that was great because I got to kind of put my own flavor into the food. I didn't have to go buy the higher ups in a restaurant. My hours were much more sane. Like I said, I was taking home more money. So it just kind of seemed like a great fit for, for a long while. And then I had my daughter and, you know, mm-hmm. anyone who becomes a parent knows like when your child is born, especially if you're the mom, usually it kind of changes everything. And mm-hmm. I realized then and there, I didn't really want to be out of the house, at least not for a while. And mm-hmm. so I, but I still cared about my career and I didn't want to just not do it anymore. Um, hey guys, if you are interested in having a consultation with me and actually see me one-on-one, um, the Chef Doc Lifestyle Medicine uh, practice has partnered with Plant-Based Telehealth and uh, we offer uh, lifestyle medicine consultations. So you'll be able to see me one-on-one and uh, I can go over your health history and seeing what we can do to fill in the gaps. Uh, we can talk about your physical health, anything from food to lifestyle to diet to setting up your kitchen to cooking preparation to grocery shopping to your mental health. Um, I think it's important that we build our emotional resilience to talking about your sleep and how to stay hydrated and what are the best uh, medicines if necessary, what are the best supplementations if necessary. And we do all this in a very concise manner and it's a conversation. I take the time out to listen. I take the time out to really understand you from the ground up and to look at all aspects um, of your physical, emotional, and mental health. And um, please, you know, uh, drop me a line, schedule an appointment if you want to see me one-on-one. And um, I am very, very looking forward to learning more about you. And again, thank you so much for visiting uh, here uh, at The Chef Doc. So sort of serendipitously, a recipe development opportunity with a restaurant chain um, by Chloe, they've since closed, but um, by Chloe, the vegan restaurant chain um, came on my lap and that kind of started my recipe development career. And since then, it's been amazing because I still get to do what I love. I get to be home with my kids. I've gotten to talk to so many amazing people in the wellness industry. And now I'm kind of starting my own thing outside of my clients. So it's really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Take us through, you know, a little bit about recipe development, because, you know, we look at these beautiful, you know, books, you know, laid out by cookbook authors. We see a lot of, you know, celebrities making cookbooks. Mm -hmm. Um, So for someone that doesn't, you know, may not be well immersed into that, you know, like, what does it take to kind of come up with your own recipe? Um, You know, even like, how does, like, how does the, how does that come about? Like, what is that process like? Yeah. So, I mean, you don't have to have gone to culinary school. I mean, I think in my case it it helped, but I don't think it's necessary. I think what you do need is just a real love for cooking and just time in the kitchen. So I think the only reason why I can do what I do is because I put so many hours in the kitchen, Um, starting in culinary school, you know, we were there full time, five days a week. And then following, I was doing it for my job. So you just get really familiar with food and how long it takes to cook something and approximately how many beans you need in like, um, you know, a pasta visual soup, like you just kind of develop a sense for that. Mm -hmm. But I can say up until the point that I started recipe development, I leaned really heavily on recipes. Like before, Mm -hmm. you know, when I was in culinary school, obviously they gave us a curriculum of recipes to cook. And then when I was private chefing, I would find recipes that I liked and practice them at home and then cook them for my clients. But I was really too afraid to kind of riff and just do my own thing Mm, and then mm. when I was told like you have to you know we want you to create this and someone's going to pay me I was like okay I guess I have to figure this out (laughs) and (laughs) yeah (laughs) so my process now it's a lot easier now than it was when I was first starting is to just first of all just get inspired like what do I feel like making whether it be like a pasta or a tart or whatever and then you know I decide the ingredients that I generally want to use and then I do research so I look in you know cookbooks i have a, a pretty big cookbook library i look online on websites that i trust and i just see 
you know, for recipes that I'm not as familiar with, I try to see like what these other chefs are doing, what methods they're using, approximately how long they're taking to cook it. And I use that sort of as a very rough guideline for me. And then I test, sometimes it comes out on the first try. Sometimes I'm cursing and cooking the same recipe like (laughs) every day, all day and until I get it right. And then, but you know, the final product is what I submit to my client. And at that point, I'm pretty confident that it'll work in a home kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So instead of, you know, the, the head chef throwing something at you, it's like, you know, you're mentally throwing something. at yourself. <laughs> Yeah. And sometimes I'm like, why did I sign up for this? Like it's, <laughs> it's brutal. Like it shouldn't be this hard to make a scone, but you know, I think yeah. one thing that I try to do is I try not to use any processed ingredients, you know, so the way I cook for my clients is the way that I cook for myself. So I don't really want to be relying heavily on vegan butters. And part of that is because, you know, like I, the way we were taught is that whole food or food in its most natural form is best. But also because like I was mentioning before, the availability of these products is so varied depending on where you live. So I can get Miyoko's butter which is amazing, you know, by the stack if I wanted, but someone in the middle of the country, like might drive a hundred miles and not find it. And then they can't make my recipe. So that stinks. So I try to include foods that pretty much everyone can find. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's great. That's, um, it speaks to the versatility, right? Mm -hmm. The creativity um, and, you know, just being resilient. I think, you know, what I love about the culinary world is really, just thinking on your feet, um, mm-hmm. you know, in the restaurant world, anything can turn on a dime in a second, um, being in the back of the kitchen, anything can turn on a dime right. in a second. Um, and even for me, like in, in medicine, in, in the global pandemic that we're in, you know, it teaches us to be more resilient. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's beautiful to kind of hear these themes, you know, kind of laid out throughout, right? So it's, um, it's about pivoting at the end of the day, you had mm-hmm. to pivot, you know, so many different ways, um, you know, at, at, on a personal level as a professional. Um, and it just speaks to, you know, you know, that you need to, to get a job done, um, a certain, you know, outcome, and you're like, I'm going to figure this out. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, you know, story. Mm-hmm. Um, let's, uh, let's transition a little bit in terms of uh, your health journey, right? Sure. Um, you have, uh, you know, made it known that you are a cancer survivor. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you've been, uh, definitely been very open and vulnerable about it. And I would love to, you know, um, if you don't mind sharing just kind of like a snapshot of, um, you know, where, where you've been, you know, over time and how, um, you know, you've been able to kind of, you know, see the light at the end of the tunnel, because depending on what type of, you know, cancer, cancer is like, you know, one of the leading causes of death in in Mm -hmm. our country, you know, depending Mm -hmm. on which one of it. Um, and, uh, it really plagues people. And this is where we get into the food and healing, right? The yeah. food is medicine and how that could be a huge contribution. Um, if not the top contribution to getting ourselves back in the track. So if you don't mind, you know, sharing your story. Yeah, sure. So, uh, back in two, 2019, I had, um, a cold that was eventually diagnosed as pneumonia. And when they were trying to get x-rays of the pneumonia in order to give me the proper meds, they found a really large cyst. Um, It was like a 12 centimeter cyst. And um, I had no symptoms for that. Um, All the coughing and cold symptoms that I had, you know, that brought me to the doctor in the first place were a result of um, pneumonia, which was unrelated. So it was just kind of a, you know, an incidental finding. Um, But, you know, it came as a total shock to me. I had labored with two children. I've run a half marathon. I'm a really active person, like not at any point in my life, did I think like, oh, there's probably something I should get checked out. So in any case, like I have this giant thing in my chest, and they decide, you know, we need to figure out what it is, obviously. So they send me to the hospital for a CAT scan, that's inconclusive, I go for, you know, an echocardiogram, um, and a couple other like heart tests, because it's right next to my heart, those are inconclusive, Mm -hmm. I go for an MRI, inconclusive, PET scan, inconclusive, like everything, like no one really knew what this thing was. In the meanwhile, I'm just kind of praying like it's nothing. Um, And they said, well, listen, like it's got some funky characteristics to it, the size, Mm -hmm. the proximity to your heart, like all these things, it just has to come out. And so at Mm -hmm. that point, I just was so freaked out by it. I was like, get it out. I don't care. Like, you know, do the surgery. And so they were going to do, they were going to try to do a minimally invasive surgery to take it out, but just because of the size, they they couldn't. So they had to do a thoracotomy. 
And um, mm. when it was removed, they determined pretty much right away that the cyst itself was benign, thank God. Um, but my surgeon had taken out my thymus gland, which, you know, as you know, as a doctor, you don't really need after you're an adolescent, pretty much. And it just kind of sits in your chest and doesn't do much. Mm. So he took it out because I think I can't remember exactly, but I think he said it looked kind of suspicious. Um, so he removed that. And at the time, I thought nothing of it. Um, but then when I went for a follow up visit a couple weeks later, just to check on my healing, he mentioned to me that they still didn't have pathology back on it. It mm. had to be sent to a lab at Sloan Kettering. And, mm -hmm. you know, at that point, mm. I was like, Sloan Kettering, you know, like, but, you know, he's like, we're just ruling things out, you know, don't worry, yeah. blah, blah, blah. So two weeks later, I got a call saying that they did find cancer on the thymus. And it was a an aggressive, rare non-Hodgkin's lymphoma called primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma. Um, the good thing, there aren't too many good things about cancer, but the good thing is that this one is particularly um, easy to cure. So it has a high cure rate. Um, so even in a worst case scenario, my odds, you know, were still pretty good. Yeah. Um, mine was stage one. So I felt like a lot mm. of things were stacked in my favor. Um, the, the origin of the cancer had been removed. My surgeon is one of the best in the area, if not the country. So he did an incredible job. Um, so the chances of like anything being left were, I don't know. In my opinion, it didn't seem like it was likely, but obviously I'm not a cancer expert. So the people at um, one of the cancer hospitals I checked in with told me that it was too risky given the aggressive nature of the cancer and they wanted to start me on chemo right away. And mm. the chemo regimen that they outlined was, you know, pretty terrifying. I mean, all chemo is terrifying, but this one was like inpatient in the hospital for over a week and just like going back, you know, mm -hmm. constantly <laughs> like cycle after cycle. And I just, I felt based on a number of factors, based on a PET scan that didn't show any cancer at that time, because I got another PET scan done, the fact that it was a curable cancer, the fact that it's stage one, the fact that, you know, the thymus had been removed, I was kind of thinking, I don't know, like, I don't know if this is like worth the physical and emotional toll it's going to take on me and my family. Yeah. But I also needed to be careful because I have children and obviously, like, they're more important than anything. Um, so I found an oncologist who was willing to let me do a wait and see approach. Um, which means that basically every couple months I would go in and submit to a full CAT scan, full blood work, a full physical exam. And I've been mm. doing that pretty much for two years now, over two years. Uh, mm. Thankfully, nothing has popped up. I've been really, really vigilant about my diet, about my lifestyle. There are certain things that really needed to be put into check. Namely, stress um, was just like running rampant. Like before mm. this diagnosis, I was I was putting myself like tenth on the list of priorities, if not lower. Um, I wasn't even like factoring in my own needs like most days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it caught up with me, and that combined with other factors that may or may not have been in my control. I don't know. Um, I found myself in this position of a cancer patient, which I never thought I would be in. But mm -hmm. you know, cancer is like that; <laughs> it can sneak up <laughs> on you. And all we can do is try to minimize our odds, which is what I try to preach now. You know, you can't guarantee someone that they're never going to get cancer, even if they're vegan, um, mm -hmm. but you can reduce your risk. And that gave me such a huge sense of control. Like a cancer diagnosis, I think anyone who's had one will tell you the loss of control is like one of the worst parts. You just feel like, what is happening? My body turned against me. Like there's, you know, it mm -hmm. just really feels like a free fall. And mm -hmm. when you find out that there are foods you can eat or foods not to eat or lifestyle practices that you can implement to potentially make the cancer go away or prevent it from coming in the first place, it's like a massive relief. But mm -hmm. you really have to believe, you have to believe in the power of those things. And then, yeah. you know, it's huge. So, yeah, yeah. I think the biggest, so number one, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, number two is, you know, you really have to find your support systems, you know, mm -hmm. even before treatment recommendation, the chemo for other people, it's radiation. Um, these are very potentially very traumatic to the psyche, you know, mentally mm -hmm. and emotionally, not just for you, but your family members for right. your close loved ones. So mm -hmm. having support groups, um, having people to trust and connect with. Um, having periods of solitude, self-reflection are so, so important. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, being as an American and having grown up, you know, myself uh, in the Northeast, it's stress levels can be at an all-time high, you know? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. 
even before the pandemic, um, I think it was a lot higher after 9-11, um, in my yeah. opinion. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know, you still operate on this chronic level of stress. Yeah. And we don't we don't consider that as being such a huge co contributor mm -hmm. um, to our overall, you know, body. You know what I'm saying? Right, um, right. Yeah, so. And I think people don't understand why stress is related. And I think I didn't understand that until I started reading about it after my diagnosis is that it's not like, you know, stress will magically manifest a tumor. Like that's not how it works. It's that, you know, stress suppresses your immune response. And as you know, and your immune system is fighting off everything from the common cold to cancer cells. And I, you know, I've mentioned in a, another interview that it did not occur to me that my immune system could potentially eradicate a cancer cell. You know, I just kind of always felt, well, if you get cancer, there is nothing you can do. And mm -hmm. that's not true. You know, like, in some cases, you know, especially in later stage cancers, it's extremely difficult for your immune system to fight it off. But in its infancy, you know, your body, if it has the right tools, and if you're treating it well, like it, it does stand a chance against cancer. And so I think if you're suppressing that, you know, your, your odds are not as good. So I think that's what happened is I had something growing. My immune system was not at its best because of yeah. that. And, you know, that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and I echo that. Um, and I tell this to my patients all the time is that, you know, you have to be able to get yourself out of your own way, you know, remove mm -hmm. the blocks, remove, mm -hmm. you know, the, the grid locks that you put on yourselves. And we don't, you know, we kind of operate outside of ourselves a lot, you know, we cater to, you know, your work or your family and everyone else, like you said, you put yourself very, very low on your priority list. Mm -hmm. And when you don't make time for that, um, you know, you're not able to take care, you know, of yourself uh, in that manner. Mm -hmm. um, was there anything into, you know, going back to food and nutrition, you know, was there anything that you had to change dramatically? Um, you know, was there any shifts that you did in terms of food wise, cooking, preparation wise, um, um, after receiving the, the diagnosis? Nothing like super dramatic. Cause like I said, I was already vegan and I was already on the healthy side of vegan. But what I can say is I started incorporating new foods in, or just like really overdosing on foods that I was eating in like moderate levels before. So mm -hmm. cruciferous vegetables specifically like took a major role in my healing. Mm -hmm. Like I would just be eating raw broccoli out of the fridge and I still <laughs> do. I mean, I genuinely really like it. So I'm kind of lucky in that sense, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, broccoli sprouts, you know, have incredible cancer fighting powers and I eat those every single day. Um, I started sprouting my own and then turmeric, you know, every day I have turmeric in supplement form, but I also add it into smoothies and sprinkle it on my food. So I get it, you know, in lots of different forms now. Um, trying to think what else, red berries, um, raw garlic. These are all things that were in my mm -hmm. diet, but I'm very intentionally putting them in my diet every day now. Yeah. And the other thing I did, which wasn't dramatic, but I used to like casually drink, like, I would say like five days a week, six days a week, you know, one or two glasses of wine, like with dinner. And I just realized like, it just, first of all, I just wasn't feeling good the next day. And, you know, anyone who's a parent, who even has like the slightest inkling of hangover nose, it is like a special kind of hell. So I was like, this is not working because my tolerance is not what it used to be back in my 20s. And so, you know, I just kind of felt the effects and then alcohol being linked to cancer directly. It's a carcin it's a known carcinogen. I just was like, this needs to, I have to either eliminate it or really reduce it and, you know, mm -hmm. find a way for it to work um, in my life. And so now I'll have red wine specifically. I don't really drink anything else for the most part, like a couple times a week in very moderate amounts. And I feel like that's a good balance for me because I know that red wine is also in a lot of the blue zones. You know, there are some known health benefits to it. So I figure, you know, this way I kind of get the best of both worlds. And mm -hmm. I feel like right now that's working. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So number one, you know, I'm really, you know, glad and fortunate and proud of your journey. And, you know, you have, you know, you're such a wonderful person and you do so much for so many other people in your audience. And, um, you know, I'm glad that, you know, you're thriving, you know, and, uh, you know, we are able to reap the fruits of your labor in terms oh, of, thank you. you know, the, you know, what you put out there. So, which leads me to, I believe your current endeavor, um, your newsletter, Plant Magic. Um, please yeah. 
you know, share what this is, you know, what is plant magic? You know, how did you come up with the name and what it currently offers? Yeah. So the name kind of came to me because I was on a call with one of my friends, um, Alex Scheitzman. She has a blog called the new baguette. And, um, we were just kind of like talking business together and I was telling her, I need a space to kind of write about all these things that I'm interested in. And I don't necessarily want to blog, but I don't necessarily just want to write like a classic newsletter. Um, so I'm thinking about starting a stub- sub stack, which is sort of like a marriage of the two. It's a new plat, relatively new platform that a lot of food writers and chefs and health people are starting to write on. And Alex said to me, you know, you could just write about like how just plants are magic or said something to that effect. And I was like, oh my God, mm-hmm. that's the name and <laughs> the plant magic. <laughs> because I really do feel like in all of their forums, plants are magic. They're magical for your health. Like if you spend time in nature, it has this like crazy effect on your well-being and stress levels and overall mood. I mean, there's science to back that. Um, and just like the earth is just like an, a magical place that we need to take care of. So I sort of felt like it ticked all these boxes of things that are so important to me, um, ways that I live my life that I kind of want to encourage people to live their lives, you know, connected to nature, connected to the earth in, in every sense. And I've just amassed so much information over my own. Like when I read something like in school, like in culinary school, or I hear something on a podcast, like I'll do a deep dive myself. Like I said before, I love being a student. So, you know, I have like textbooks, like books on every single subject, like having to do with holistic wellness and cancer, especially like I've just, I always laugh. I say like, I'm pretty much an internet oncologist now. Um, (laughs) So I've amassed all this information. I feel like it has to go somewhere. It has to help somebody else. And so I feel like this is my outlet for indulging in my own interests and also getting this information out there to whoever needs it. Sure, sure. And um, yeah, I think there's nothing, I think before when the internet age came out, I think blogging was probably one of the most, um, you know, most personable, um, you know, deep dive into someone's, you know, journey. Um, Mm -hmm. And in a way... I kind of feel like social media just kind of diluted all that yeah, a little bit. Yeah, so I agree. there's nothing there's nothing really, you know, um that can replace it because it's such a deep dive into, you know, one's thoughts. It's mm-hmm. almost like having someone's diary, you mm-hmm. know, pu- public view in some sense, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um so yeah, I um you know, I took a look at it. It's beautiful, you know, the you. the you know, plant magic and I highly encourage uh, we'll put it in the show notes to, you know, share um Chef Lauren's uh, newsletter. Uh, but it's beautiful. There's a lot of great, you know, offerings there, um, you know, just her own personal thoughts and words. And, you know, you have recipes and things like that. Are you yep. promoting like any programs or it's uh, currently uh, right just... now? Right now, I'm not. I hope to in the future. And when I do, you'll be the first to hear about it. And everyone else um, that follows me and subscribes. But Plant Magic is, you know, it's free for whoever wants to sign up. Um, and there's also a paid subscriber option. So you definitely do not have to pay. But if you do, it's a pretty small amount. It's the amount of like a latte a month. And um, that will give you access to posts that I've done a little bit of a deeper dive on. So I detail my personal holistic cancer routine. I list everything like from the supplements I took, the brands, I link to the brands, like the books I read, like everything. Um, That's an example of a paid post. Um, But you can certainly get benefit for free. And uh, yeah, so you can just go to laurenkretzer.substack.com. Um, there's also a link to it in my Instagram profile, and I'm going to be working on that for a while. I publish recipes there, as you said. Um, and eventually, if I have the time and bandwidth for more, I certainly hope <laughs> to have something else to offer. Nice, nice, for sure, for sure. Yeah. But I think that's a another great uh, baby for you, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be able to like nurture and nourish and, and all that jazz. Yeah. So before we close out, I wanted to ask you... Um, going back to what you said before, you started off as, um, you know, a vegetarian, ethical, you know, vegan, you know, um, mm-hmm. that was inspired by your parents. Um, and I want to I want to ask you, based off of our current, um, I guess, time in terms of where the, where the world is with climate change, with, you know, animal we- welfare, what would you say would be like your top, you know, one or two action steps that on an individual that they can take in terms of, you know, making the world, you know, a a, a better place, you know, whether it's regards to just a global (laughs) sense, because I think we do talk a lot about food and nutrition here on the space, but Mm -hmm. we, you know, the food industry has done a very good job in terms of, you know, dissonance in, in, in creating that distance between how animals are treated Mm -hmm. and, 
and all that process until how it arrives on your plate per se. So, mm -hmm. you know, is there anything you could, you know, offer to the listeners, you know, because a lot of times when people, you know, they think about a subject so big, they're mm -hmm. like, oh, how can I, how can I, on an individual level, you know, contribute to that or, yeah. you know, make a dent in that? And they just don't, right? Right, so. right, right. And I get that. And I mean, I think this could be a really long answer, but I'm going to try to make yeah. it succinct for you. But basically, I think the all or nothing thinking, you know, has to go. I think sometimes people are so overwhelmed, not only with the problems of the world, which are real, um, but also just changing, you know, for someone who's used to eating meat three times a day, two times a day, the, the thought of giving that up forever is really scary. And it's like, how do I start? And even if they wanted to start, what will their spouse think? What will their roommate think? You know, like, there's a lot of hurdles. So I think taking out the all or nothing thinking is the first step. Just make some changes. You know, there's so many ways to do it. There's a book called Vegan Before Six. You know, have vegan breakfast and lunch. Have just vegan dinner. Have just vegetarian dinner if you can't go vegan. Do like the vegan every other day. Like whatever system works for you, do it. Or just give up some things. Like I always say when I first went vegan, like I didn't like yogurt. And I'm like, why am I eating yogurt? I'm eating it because I think I need calcium, like as if there's no other sources of calcium, like eliminate the foods in your life that you could go without or save it for when it's like really special. So if you love ice cream, don't eat crappy ice cream, wait until it's like the really great brand that you love. So just try to scale back whenever possible. Um, the other thing is, is I think people feel like, what am I like, you know, what difference am I going to make? You know, this problem is so huge. If, if I go vegan, that's not going to fix the world. You know what? One person does not fix the world, but a lot of one people do. And it does shift or slow things down. And I think just taking personal responsibility, you know, people say my choice to eat meat or my choice to eat dairy is a personal choice. And it's actually not, you know, when you're eating something that's directly killing another being and or helping to like, you know, destroy the planet. That's not really a personal choice. It's kind of like saying drinking and driving is a personal choice. You're impacting someone else, yeah, many other people. Yeah. So I think taking personal responsibility without shame, you know, I, I was a meat eater at 1.2. I ate cheese at 1.2, but I think at some point I realized like I have to change because now I know better. So doing better when you know better um, and taking responsibility, I think is huge. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think it's mindset shifts, you know, mm -hmm. it's the paradigm shift. And, you know, it's unconditioning ourselves to think that, you know, I'm not going to make that much of a change. I'm not going to make that much of a, you know, dent. And who am I, you know, to do all that? Mm -hmm. And quite honestly, I really think that, you know, our vote, you know, whether to, you know, purchase something in terms mm -hmm. of food choices is very, very powerful. Definitely. You know, um, and I like your analogy of, yeah, the individual may not, you know, cause as much of a ripple effect, but a lot of individuals mm -hmm. together, you know, um, yeah. and I think this is where the internet and social media can, you know, help us, you know, be able to, you know, spread that word, you know, mm -hmm. and doing, doing the work that you're doing. Um, and, uh, and everyone else that's uh, on this movement uh, is very important because we don't want, we don't have the luxury of time. You know what I'm saying? Um, right. Mother nature is not going to wait for us to wake up, you know, yeah. it will either fight back. Um, and I can assure you that, you know, planet will be here far, far after, you know, we're gone. So, mm -hmm. um, but you know, we have to be able to treat because I think that, um, you know, we all live in the same place, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, why not? You know, so. I agree. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren, thank you so much uh, for taking the time out, sharing your stories, being all open and vulnerable with us today. Um, I, uh, you know, always, uh, you know, treated you, you know, really value our friendship and thank I really you. admire and respect your work um, in so many different hats that you wear um, and serving the world the way you do. So number one, thank you for uh, the work that you do, the person you are, and, uh, you know, just being incredible. So thank you. Thank you. And the world needs more doctors like you. I wish more doctors <laughs> were interested in lifestyle medicine. So keep on doing what you're doing. And thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Right back at you. Um, thank you again. Uh, we'll definitely share, you know, your newsletter on the show notes and, uh, everyone, thank you so much for watching another episode of Thrive Bites. If you like this, please, uh, like, uh, comment, and subscribe. And if you feel like this is a benefit for someone else, please let them know. And until then, please say goodbye to Chef Lauren. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Yeah. 
Hey guys, thank you so much for watching that episode. We hope that you enjoyed it. If you like this, please like, follow, and subscribe. And please follow us for the latest updates for this season, season five. And if you feel that this was a benefit for someone else, please let them know. And please follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, and YouTube. And thank you so much again. And we will see you on the next one.